El que sufre más. El que sufre más. A couple of years ago, I listened to a story about a Franciscan priest who went into a small village in a remote part of South America. And as the priest reached his destination, he met a woman on the outskirts of the village who had 11 children. And the priest asked her if she had a favorite. Is it Alejandro? Is it Pilar? Is it Jose? Is it Susie? Is it Mark? Which one? Which one is your favorite? And the woman looked up into the priest's eyes, and she said, I love all my children with the steady love of a mother, but the one I love the most is El que sufre más, the one who suffers the most. The woman went on to say that one day it might be Alejandro, and on the next day it might be Pilar, and the next day it might be a different child, but the one the one I love the most is El que sufre más, the one who suffers the most. I start with that story today because it is the steady love of the, that mother in the story today, and it's precisely what Jesus is proclaiming in Luke's gospel the ones who are suffering the most are at the heart of Jesus' message and ministry. The steady love of a mother for all her children is embodied in the life of Christ. Jesus portrays a steady love and attends to the brokenhearted, attends to those deprived of rights or privileges of others, attends to those disconnected from God's love and forgiveness and joy, those most in need of the inclusivity of a community. This, this steady love and acceptance is at the heart of Jesus' being. He stood up, he unrolled the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he sought out the place. He sought out the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, and he sat down. That's it. That's it. That's the inaugural address Jesus gives at the beginning of his public ministry. The first sermon, so to speak. 51 words. That's it. And I doubt that will ever happen here, so don't get your hopes up. But the proclamation that Jesus delivered to the people that day sets the tone and establishes the priorities for the narratives to come. In fact, our entire reading out of Luke is essentially Jesus' life, ministry, and purpose all in a nutshell. And I surmise it is to set the tone and purpose for our narrative, too. So Jesus, being anointed with the power of the Spirit, by the way, Luke and writers use the power of the Spirit frequently, or the Spirit in general, to describe Jesus throughout Luke's gospel, which perhaps speaks of Jesus' authority as he teaches and preaches. And what does this 
spirit-led authority begin with a claim. A claim to bring good news to the poor. Good news to those who were not just penniless. You see, most people were penniless. But to those who were afflicted and oppressed in general. Feeling, freeing the captives referred to those who were unjustly imprisoned. In fact, freeing the captives meant whatever kept one in captivity or bondage. The military term, captives of war, refers to the ones broken in pieces or the shattered ones. But good news. Jesus proclaimed for those who were, for those who are broken, battered, and beaten down, he proclaimed the good news to the poor. So, who are the poor? El que sufre más. And I have a hunch, just a hunch, that the message Jesus delivered that day in the synagogue was not solely directed toward the authoritative power of the kings who portrayed themselves as grand liberators and generous benefactors, who in their boisterous speeches decided a person's worth simply by their own proclamations. No, no boisterous speech for Jesus. He simply reaches for the ancient text and reads aloud the words that cut to the heart of his mission and ministry. But I have this nagging feeling that the message Jesus proclaimed that day was also for the chief priests and the leaders in the synagogue too. You know, the ones who ultimately crucify him. The ones who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo within their religious communities. The ones who live under a rule and organize themselves into neatly placed religious circles without thought to those excluded. Personally, and I'm afraid sometimes we too use these same measuring tools unknowingly, perhaps, to keep people on the outer rim of our religious circles. And whether we realize it or not, there's a consequence to that. In our reading from Corinthians today, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth is a stark reminder of how a missing member, a weaker part, a broken part, a left out part, affects the whole body of Christ and its mission to bring good news to the poor and to the suffering. God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as God chose. There are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are in indispensable, absolutely necessary. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with honor because God has arranged the body. You know, the church is in the season 
of Epiphany right now, and I have to be honest with you. While working on this sermon and reading and rereading and rereading some of the text, I experienced an epiphany myself. I realized that sometimes my zealousness and passion to seek out people's spiritual gifts and see the body of Christ as a well-oiled machine with everyone doing and using their gifts so we can get it all done isn't quite the mission that Jesus portrayed in his 51-word sermon nor what Paul was saying to the church at Corinth. You see, in my drivenness, I have overlooked some things, some people. It is vital to the life of the church to use our gifts and do the work. Yes, 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 absolutely. But it is so, so, so much more than that. It's more than just the body parts and the production. And so much more than how we arrange them. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You do bring good news to the poor and you call us to love with a mother's steady love. And your radical reversal of power is not just to do the ministry, but to be, to be the body of Christ. A body which places compassion and love and forgiveness, grace, and relationship at the core of every single thing we do. A body which draws us into a greater relationship with God, with each other, and with those who suffer the most. El que sufre mas. And I believe with all my heart, that when we nurture this type of body, we are not just a bustle of activity, but we are free to be the body of Christ in communion with each other, with all our jagged edges and jumbled up jargon and missteps along the way. Oh, I am so grateful to be the body of Christ with you. To experience together the living word of God read week after week after week after week. It's what connects the sinews and tendons and muscles together, and it's what nourishes us. The good news that Jesus spoke is not a concept, not an idea, nor an institution. The good news does not rise and fall in the realm of societal shifts or pandemics or messy lives or death or divorce or addiction. The good news is not determinant of who we are, what we have done, not done, or what we can do, or of where we think we belong because of our successes and our failures. The good news, the good news is a person who stood up, unrolled the scroll, and read, I bring good news to the poor. 
proclaim release to the captives, bring sight to the blind, and let the oppressed go free. El que sufre más. <laughs>